what if you only had 30 minutes to live? Those were some near misses, weren't they? And nobody got killed or, or badly injured in any of those that you saw. But that was, it was that close, right? When you came today to uh, church, how many of you passed another car running at least 65, 55 when you were coming to church? You were within three feet of death every time you passed the car. And some of us may only live 30 minutes. What if you only had 30 minutes today, 30 days to live? And I want you to think about it in terms of minutes today because that's about how long this will last, about 30 minutes. If you had 30 days to live, what would you do different? We looked at last week, we began the series, 30 Days to Live, and we looked at the final days of Jesus on the earth. You might have heard the story about the man who was very, very ill. He went to the doctor and, and had his test done, and his doctor called his wife in for the consult after the test. The doctor said, your husband, very, very ill lady. He has a very serious disease, but it's treatable. If you will cook for three meals a day for him, prepare them just like he likes them, give him every physical desire he asks for for every day for the next six months, he'll be just fine. The wife went back out to her husband and said, Honey, I have bad news for you. The doctor says you're not going to live. That's a pretty, pretty old joke, but it's, it's pretty true, isn't it? You know, the only thing that's really certain in our lives is, is uh, as they say, death and taxes, right? But in reality, it's death and the rapture. Death or the rapture. If you happen to be alive at the rapture and you're saved, you're going to go with Jesus. If you're not, you get left behind. And, but if you are uh, in that predicament and where you have uh, to face death and you don't have Christ in your life, then we have a, you're in bad shape. And, and our whole purpose of uh, this sermon series is to help you get ready to you know, ready to, to die. Living as if you're dying, because we all are in reality. We don't know how much time we have left. You know, I, I did that uh, death clock the other day. I don't know if you if you had a chance to go do the death clock. How many of you went and did that? Brother Mark clicked that one time for me. It's not going. There we go. Back one. There we go. Uh, how many of you actually went back and did that? Anybody? Some of you were probably afraid to. You were probably, oh, I'll, I'll, get a, I'll get jinxed if I do that, and I'll tempt, no, I don't think you'll get jinxed. But I, I did it. I went in there and put my, my height, my weight, my body mass index, all that stuff in there. And my death rate according, or my death date according to that calendar is September, or no, October the, uh, no, it is September, let me see, September the 12th, 2039, and I'll be 87 years old, Brian, if I live that long. Now, might not, you know, I could get in a car wreck or, you know, get hurt in the woods hunting or something. Get, you know, you, you never know on the accidental type things. But uh, with all things normal, they think I would live to be 87. Of course, my granddaddy's lived to be old like that. My grandma was almost 100 when she died on my mama's side. And my granddad on my daddy's side lived way up in his high 90s. So longevity is in our background. So maybe maybe that will be true. But... You notice that I've marked off some days. So we started the series here. Now look how many days are gone out of that 30 days. How many do we have left? How many have got left? How many days in that month? That 30 days? Not many, do we? Three weeks left or so, Three, almost four weeks. Uh, listen, I usually... Uh, Preachers have a hard time. I'll just, I'll just say it that way. We have a hard time deciding what we're supposed to do when people call us and ask us to come do stuff, okay? Because we're always getting called lots of times all hours of the night. And the hardest decision I have to make is, am I supposed to go? Because all people say, oh, yeah, the Lord told me to tell you. <laughs> you, how, you how many of you, anybody ever said that to you? The Lord told me to tell you, right? And, and I get a lot of opportunities to preach. But, you know, is it, should I take all of them? That's the question. Should I take every opportunity? And sometimes I think, oh, if I don't go, you know, maybe somebody won't hear. And, uh, I have to make that decision. I have to decide. And I, uh, when is it proper to say no for a pastor? When's it, when is it proper to say no for a person like yourself that's not a pastor? 
to uh, opportunities in life. I usually don't turn an opportunity down when it comes to preaching the gospel, uh, doing a wedding, that sort of thing, because I know I'll have an opportunity. Uh, but is that always right? What if, what if I got a call from you and, you, and I, need, I really need you to come, Pastor, right now, I need you to come. But my wife has something planned for my grandchild that day, and it's a birthday party for my grandchild, for my, my son or daughter or my grandchildren. Should I drop what I'm doing to go to them? See, I have to, I have to decide those things, and you, you have to decide those things in your life. What is, what is, your, uh, what, what is your priority in life? And, and when is it good or right to say no? Uh, sometimes uh, I'll go to, to a church, not this one particularly, but I'll go some places to preach or maybe have an opportunity to preach, and when I get done, I go... I don't know why. I don't. I don't think I did any good there. I don't know why I went. You know, but I did out of obedience to God. I would do it anyway. You know. Uh, other times, uh, if I turn down an opportunity, I start feeling badly. I start feeling guilty. Why didn't I go? Why didn't I do that? Uh, but from here forward, I've decided to ask myself this: Would you do this if you only had thirty days left to live? Would I go if I only had 30 days left to live? That's the question, and uh, I hope that you will ask that question in your life. Whatever you're doing in life, whatever you're trying to accomplish in life, would you still do it? And would you still be doing it if you only had 30 days left to live? That's a great idea, isn't it? To, to be able to say yes because you know if you only had 30 days to live, you would do it because it's a high-impact opportunity that you ought to take. But other high-impact things happen every day with my wife that I ought to be there with, right? Why, why do I say that? Well, because life is brief. Listen, life is a vapor. Look with me in the Bible this morning. Uh, in, in fact, I want to look at, before I get there, I want to show you a little chart here. I looked this up yesterday. The world death rate. Uh, 151,600 people die each day across the world. 6,316 people die each hour. 105 people die each minute. And nearly two people die each second. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. That's six people across the earth that have gone into eternity, many of them without Christ in their heart. The Word of God says in, in Psalms chapter 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. Hold your hand up. About as wide as your hand, a handbreadth. And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. See, listen to it in the, in the New Living Translation. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At, at best, each of us is but a breath. Listen to what Brother James says. And I'm going to jump over uh, to the New Living Translation. In James chapter 4, starting with verse 13. Look here, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is this. If the Lord wants us to, to we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Ooh, that's pretty pointed, isn't it? Pretty pointed. Let's begin with prayer this morning as we think about 30 days to live. Living as if you're dying, what would you do different if you only had 30 days to live? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the word, and I thank you, Lord, that it reminds us of how the brevity of our life, Lord, how short it really is. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will start making the best use of our time and, Lord, we will start doing it like you would have us do it, Lord. Living each moment as if you were taking our life and taking us home today. In Jesus' name, amen. Got a call yesterday when I was working on my sermon and 
I usually dedicate the first part of that Saturday morning to just cut everybody out, out of the picture and I go back and polish the sermon a little bit. And I, I was in there in my study by myself and got a phone call and uh, one of my dear friends, and he could barely talk. And uh, I thought for a moment, I said, oh no, Uncle Jimmy or Aunt Carolyn has gone home to be with Jesus. And there were some older friends of mine, which are his parents. And he finally came back on the phone, got his composure. And it wasn't them at all, but it was a 33-year-old nephew went home to be with Jesus this week. A, a friend of ours that's a graduate of North Florida Christian School, uh, pray for the family, the last family, whose last name is Henry, and I would ask that you pray for them because uh, Jamie's with Jesus today, and uh, he wasn't last week. He, he was a saved man, a saved young man, and a good person, but... He didn't know that he only had that length of time to live, but he was ready. He was ready to, to make that final trip. So pray for that family. And some of you might have seen the other Henry family in Kentucky. Anybody keep up with that? Did you know the ones that Miss Monty watched their funeral yesterday and the loss of three young children in a fire? You might have seen that. It was kind of ironic that their last name was Henry as well. But uh, I, I thought about that pastor preaching that sermon, a granddaddy preaching three children's, with his own grandchildren's sermon, three white caskets. <laughs> you see, you don't know how much time you have. We think we have a lot of time, and listen, you don't know how much time you have. So it's critical that you listen to God's word and you get your hearts ready, because we may only have 30 days to live. First thing that we need to do in, in relation to that is, is start turning our wins into now. Start turning your win into now. Too many of us are wishing our lives away. When such and such happens, then I will do such and such. You know, when uh, I get a good job, I'll finally tithe. When when I get to this point, whatever it may be, I'll be happy. Uh, when I get a nice home, then I'll join a Sunday school class and get my children involved in a life group and. When my job gets under control, I'll start spending more time with my children. When the kids get out of the house, then we'll work on our marriage and try to make it better. And when, then, rarely happens, does it? You see, we need to start thinking about turning our wins into now. Now, I don't know what your win then is today, but today's the day that God will ask you to turn that win into now. Why? Because life's brief. You don't know how much time you have left. We don't, might only have 30 days left. Life is brief. It's fleeting. We've got to start turning our thens and our wins into nows. Now, I'm still learning how to juggle ministry after being in full-time ministry since 1985. I'm still learning. I haven't reached that point of knowing everything on that yet. But like myself, many other pastors are extremely driven. We're driven people sometimes. I'm a driven type person. But I'm learning to live life in the moment. Wherever you are, remember this statement, wherever you are, be there. I find myself sometimes when I'm there, I'm somewhere else in my mind and I'm doing something else and working on some other project far away from what I'm actually involved in right there. If you're with your kids or your wife or your friends, be there. Don't be like I was for so many years, a thousand miles away, focusing, working on something else in my brain while I'm with my children or my wife or my family. Start living life in the moment because it will soon be gone. Psalms 118, verse 24, listen to this. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This day, this, is, this day is made by God. In this moment is made by God. Whatever's happening with you and your wife and your children or your friends is happening right now because God allowed it. He said, this is the day the Lord's made. I will rejoice in, in, in it. It's a simple little verse, but it says so much, doesn't it? That this is the day. Live this day today. Make it count. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. My little nephew was sitting right there. They were target practicing one day. I think you were shooting a 7 millimeter, weren't you? And they were shooting at a, at a target on a couple hundred yards away on a good range, a good shooting range. It wasn't like a makeshift range, and they were shooting a metal target. 
and the bullet ricocheted from that metal target right back and hit Stephen right on that bone part of the, the, the bullet. That close to sending him into eternity. Now it messed his eye up. He still has trouble with that eye. But the shell, part of that brass from that shell came all the way back 100 yards away and whacked him right there. Just that much below his eye. And had it gone in the eye, it would have gone in his brain. He would not be here today and God protected him. He's still with us. You see, in an instant, your life can change. Don't boast about tomorrow. The scripture says, live here in the moment. Make every moment count. Turn the, the, the thens and the winds into nows. Why? Because you may only have 30 days to live. And what would you do different if you found that out? Bonnie and I went yesterday, we practiced this a little bit yesterday. We, we went to Chiefland to pick up a prescription and, and uh, when we got done with the prescription, she said, let's get a milkshake. Like I need a milkshake, but I said, sure, honey. Okay. Or it turned out a good milkshake, you know. So we went over to, she said, let's go to McDonald's and get a milkshake. And they, you know, they put this stuff on top, you know, and all that, what's they call that stuff? The whipped cream on top, you know, is, I mean, good milkshake. So we get up there, we pull up there, and we'd like three or two large milkshakes, vanilla. One with the cream and one without. Because I, I like them to fill the cup all the way up and leave that fuzzy stuff off. She says, I'm sorry, sir, but today, I'm sorry to say, but today is the day we clean the ice cream machine. There's no ice cream or, or milkshakes today. I go, really? I said, yeah, I'm sorry. And I said, oh, okay. She said, well, let's go. We'll, look, we'll find one. So let's go to Burger King. So we went down to Burger King. Have it your way, right? How many of you heard that? Have it your way. Pull up to the driver's window or to the, uh, the little speaker there. I said, I would like two large milkshakes. And they had this salty caramel one on sale. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? I wanted vanilla till I saw that. I said, well, salty caramel, that's it, you know. I said, two large shakes. She said, I'm sorry, sir, we only sell mediums. I said, pardon me? <laughs> said, I'm sorry, sir, we only sell mediums. I said, well, we want two mediums in. We want one vanilla and we want one salty caramel. So we got our medium Remember that if you go to Burger King, they only sell one side. I thought it was have it your way, by the way. It wasn't my way. I didn't get it my way. So I turned to Bonnie. I go, I thought it was, I thought it was have it your way. I didn't get it my way. But, you know, we just laughed, and we enjoyed the moment. You know, we turned our when and our then into now. We didn't, I didn't get mad and go in there, you want, you, you advertise, have it your way. Give me a large. And I didn't do that. We just enjoyed each other's company. And we sipped on our milkshakes, headed south on 19. Turn the air conditioner up cold, turn the radio on, and enjoyed each other's company. And we had that moment in time where everything else was nothing. There was nothing but just us. We turned our wind into now. Listen, some of you are missing out because you're so bottled up and worried about everything else rather than, than just experiencing the moment with your loved one. Listen, you don't know that you have much more time. You may only have 30 days to live. <laughs> Make the best of this moment right now. Turn your wins into nows. Second thing, turn intentions into actions. You have so many things you say you're going to do, and I, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'm preaching the bill, so when I point at you, I've always got three pointing back, okay? I say I'm going to do certain things, and there's so many things I haven't done yet. I want to do, I want to do a lot of stuff for that pretty lady sitting over there. It's my wife, you know, and, but see, you're the same way. There's a lot of stuff you have intentions that you say you're going to do stuff and you haven't done it yet. Do what God puts in your heart and do it now. Okay? You, you might only have 30 days to live. The late of obedience is disobedience. Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 27 and following. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it. This is verse 27. Proverbs 3. Do not hold with good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you know you have it with you. Listen, do it now. Turn your intentions into actions. Do it not. Do it now, today, before the sun goes down. Whatever God's telling you to do, I, I'm not your, your boss and I'm not your Holy Spirit, I'm just your pastor. But the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and telling you some stuff right now that you're supposed to be doing, and, and you need to do it today, before the sun goes down, before your next meal, before you even think about it, before the devil or your fears can talk you out of it. Do it. Do it now. Turn your intentions into actions now. Turn your intentions into actions. 
Third thing, turn my whole or your whole heart to Jesus. We all hold back a little bit. We say we give, we give our whole self to Jesus. No, we don't. <laughs> we all hold back a little bit, don't we? I want to. My desire is that. But we need to really consciously think about that, that we turn our whole heart to Jesus. You remember the, the guy Jesus was talking to, and uh, he said, you know, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? And he says, you just keep the, do what you're supposed to do. Follow God. And he said, well, I do. I kept all the law my whole life. And Jesus said, sell all you have, give to the poor. You know, see, he was not far from the kingdom of God. He was close. He was not far from it. But you miss it by a little bit. You know, we, we have to be real careful that we turn our whole heart to Jesus. See, too many people just turn a portion of their hearts toward Jesus. Uh, every year, if you, go, if you go get a flu shot, and a doctor, how many of you get flu shots? What is, what is a flu shot? What does a flu shot do, doc? But what does it do? It gives you the flu a little bit, right? Yeah, it gives you a, a scaled-down version, and what does your body do? makes an immunity to it. But see, we get the flu to fight the flu. That's crazy, isn't it? But that's just the way God made our wonderful bodies that you, your body builds up defenses against that. Uh, but see, sometimes we can get immune to what God is doing. We can get just a little bit of religion, just a little bit of Jesus, but we don't let him totally change us. So we get build up the immunities really to what God is really wanting to do in our heart. And that's the danger sometimes in a Christian school. Kids hear it every day. And they, but they, they build a, a shell around their heart, and God really doesn't break through and, and work on their heart. They just outwardly look good, look clean, the cup looks good, but see, they haven't turned their whole heart to Jesus. And it's critical that we all do that. From the oldest adult in here to the youngest child, we need to turn our whole heart to Jesus. Uh, you, know, you know, that's just what many Christians do. We have just enough Jesus to make us resistant to the real thing. Just enough Jesus to, to give an immunity. A little bit of church, a little bit of prayer, a little bit of giving, a little bit of good deeds, a little bit of worship, a little bit of Jesus fish, a little Easter, a little WWJD bracelet, what would Jesus do? And, but, you know, we just don't get enough. We don't go all the way with Jesus. We don't give Him our whole heart. Things get rough and we, we, we add a little bit of prayer. You know, when you do that, you fool yourself. You're close to the kingdom, but you're not fully sold out to Jesus. Wouldn't it be terrible to miss it by a hair's breadth because you didn't give your whole heart to Christ? Wouldn't it be terrible to be, look religious and look Christian, but not really be the real deal? Listen, turn your whole heart to Jesus. Honestly, I think that's the most dangerous place to be. Just get just where you think you have it. Oh, remember that? I don't know if you remember this. Some of you probably, some of you old people will. But there used to be a, a a hair tonic called Brill Cream. Anybody remember that? Who remembers that? You're dating it. Was it? What was the statement? A little dab, a little dab will do you. A little tiny bit, a little dab, and you put it on your hair, and you look great. And the women come after you, and your hair doesn't jump around, and get in the wind and it stays like it's supposed to. little some of you don't have hair are frowning at me I'm not I, I'm not picking on you please a little dab won't do you when it comes to Christ okay I want just a little bit of Jesus no you don't want a little dab you want the whole deal you want a hundred percent you want all of it I remember I was a 15-year-old kid and preacher's kid, rebellious in my heart, uh, rebellious when my p parents weren't around. That I didn't act out in front of them, but behind the doors, when, they didn't, when I wasn't with my mom and daddy, I wasn't what you thought I was. And I remember at an old revival meeting at Southside Baptist Church, old Moody Adams was preaching, and he was preaching on the crucifixion, Brother Brian. And, he, and, it, and I saw for the first time how that, that blood coming down Jesus' face and down his side and off of that cross and how it, that I caused it. <laughs> My sins caused that. He went there for me. <laughs> and for the very first time, I understood what it really meant.
to be a lost sinner needing Christ. And I'd grown up in church my whole life. I'd gone to church nine months before I was born. I was in the church every time the doors were open. I learned how to pray as a little tiny kid in church. And I didn't know Jesus. And I remember how I just was overwhelmed with the need for Christ. I wanted Jesus in me. I wanted to be fully a Christian, not a fake, but a real deal. A real deal Christian, not a little dab. I wanted the whole load. <laughs> I wanted it all. And I remember giving my heart to Christ and how my life began to change at that point. Those things that I, that I was participating in started falling away. And, and, I, and I became a new creature. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Listen, you don't want just a little bit. You want to give your whole heart to Jesus. You know, you might have grown up in church. You might have Christian parents. Listen, being born in the church and having Christian parents won't make you any more Christian than being born in a garage will make you a Volkswagen. You could be born in a garage and it won't make you a car. Listen, the same way you can be born in a Christian home. You can be born in a Christian nation. It doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is when you personally accept the Lord Jesus Christ and follow Him as your Lord and Savior. Now, as we conclude today, why don't you start living like you're dying? Living, not that we go around, oh, it's terrible. No, I'm happy. I'm having fun. I'm going to enjoy every second with my bride and my children and my grandchildren and telling people about Christ and serving here at this church. And I'm having fun in life. You know, and I'm going to enjoy every second. If it were my last 30 seconds, I'm having fun with Jesus. Amen? That's what we're talking about. We say living like you're dying is, listen, it's a, it's a great life. Because you don't have to worry about <laughs> what's going to happen in 30 seconds or 30 minutes or 30 days or 30 years. You don't have to worry about death and dying because it's taken care of. It, it was solved 2,000 years ago on a rugged, cruel cross on Calvary. When Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins and, and He gives us a free ticket into heaven, He wants you to be there with Him too, and, but He doesn't force His way into your life. You have to accept Him as your Lord and Savior. I want you to think about living as if you only had 30 days to live. And if you did, would you seek God more passionately? Think about it for a minute. Would you seek God more passionately? Would you serve Him with more zeal? And more excitement if you only had 30 days to live. Listen, let's turn our wins into nows. Let's turn our intentions into actions. Let's turn our whole hearts toward God. Don't just get a little dab. <laughs> get the whole deal. It's time for you. It's just time for you to decide that. You know, I was young and I'm old. <laughs> but you know what? It's exciting to be alive. And yeah, I may live to be 87. Who knows? Brother Phil, how old are you now? You're in the 80s, aren't you? Little dabble, do you? He won't tell me. He's on up there. But look at him. He's happy. He's on the front row of church. He, he's excited, you know. Hey, we may get to live to be his age, but we might not. Well, like Jamie, we might be in heaven already. Or like those three little children in Kentucky. Three little young children that a mommy, a young couple, a young couple in their 20s has to deal with now. They're little three children in heaven, you know. And, oh, you know, you might not know this. My daughter, Elizabeth, they've had three fires. Hold up three fingers. The first house they lived in in Otter Creek, the, a shed caught on fire next door, and it burnt right up to the door. She was pregnant and asleep inside, didn't know it. The, the fire was burning up the wooden door, and a neighbor saw it and, and ran in and woke her up, got her out of it, you know, rescued her because the husband was working. They moved into a brand new double wide in Gulf Hammond, Florida. And they they were in the other room and the kitchen caught on fire, burnt the house right before Christmas time. Burnt the brand new place with all the Christmas presents and everything. Everything they had burnt to the ground. They escaped with not one scratch. They moved into Grandma Yerdy's old double wide down on the creek, about two or three hundred yards from where they lived. And there had been a, back in the 04 storm season, a lot of the roofs had come off, and that roof had been ripped part of it. So they put a brand new metal roof on that place. I mean, brand new, beautiful green, I think it was. 
But when they put the roof on, they per forgot to puncture through the roof and put the, the fireplace, which had a gas log fireplace, they forgot to put the stack through the roof. So it was winter. They moved in there, and they were using that fireplace. Middle of the night, my son-in-law looked, and it said, there's a fire behind the wall. Sure enough, they couldn't get it put out. They escaped with not one scratch alive. Listen, we know what it is to be having been close to, to close call. They're still alive and they're still well. Nobody died. My other daughter, you, you might think I'm making this up. This is all true. I'm telling you, I'm telling you true stories. Lauren, their first place they lived in, single wide, burnt to the ground and they all escaped at night. They got a brand new double wide while they were installing and hooking the, the double wide up, one of the they put a, they put a lag bolts with with a, a impact wrench and tie them together. One of the lag bolts went through the electrical wire, didn't know it. So this didn't burn right then, but they're in the house and Lauren said, "Jason, I think I smell smoke." He ran outside and there was fire underneath, burning. We're on fire. This is second time now. For my other, this is not the same daughter. This is another daughter. They all got out and escaped, not one scratch. Now, they lost a lot of possessions, but they kept their lives. That's not the end of the story. You can't hardly believe this, can you? My son built a brand new home, brand new two-story home on the week highway. Beautiful home. They hadn't been in it a, a month, and the hole upstairs started filling up with smoke. They, he ran up there to check and the heating unit had malfunctioned and caught on fire inside the attic. Now, they were able to get it out. It didn't burn down, thank God. But brothers and sisters, listen to me. We're only a heartbeat away from death. God was good to us. I didn't have to preach three funerals like my, my brother Henry did up there. I didn't have to preach a 33-year-old's funeral like my other sister Henry and Tallahassee did, that we're going to do next week. God has given us more time and been so gracious to us. But I'm telling you, you don't know how long you have. What if you only had 30 days to live? Would your life change? I sure hope so. We're going to close right now, and I'm going to offer just a, an opportunity for you. If you want to, to fix stuff, <laughs> today's we're to fix it place. <laughs> Listen, this is it. This is, God fixes stuff. And, and when we have an invitation time, it's time for, for you to respond to what you've heard. Our team is going to come and sing, and I'm going to be up here on this front row on the side here. If you have anything you want to talk about, if you want to, to, to talk to, to the Lord and, and have Him fix your, whatever the problem may be in your life, you come and talk to me after, we, after it's over. We'll have a song and then a closing prayer, and everybody will go that way. You come this way and, and talk with me, and let's, let's talk to Jesus. Amen? Go ahead.